last we saw Luca in Chrono Cross, Lynx and Harl had abducted her from the orphanage to make her unlock the Promethean Circuit's lock on the frozen flame. Everyone said she died, but it's never confirmed. The only thing we got was the whole thing ended in failure. So what if he like threw her in a, kind of, in a prison instead? It was like, okay, you don't want to work on unlocking the, the lock on the frozen flame. You don't want to help me. You're just going to go to jail until you change your mind. So he imprisons her in Chronopolis somewhere, like maybe on one of these like little satellite islands or something. And he's like, you can sit there and you can think about it until you decide if you ever want your freedom back, then you can just help me get the frozen flame. And, and Luke is like, okay, well, maybe if you want me to help you get the frozen flame, maybe you should give me like the old parts of Robo that are still left because I can study him better. Because remember, Robo became part of the Prometheus circuit. He's basically the Prometheus circuit, but it's not totally explained how that happened. There could be parts of him still kicking around. You know, maybe uh, Balthazar like, integrated the core of Robo or just some parts of Robo. You know, the essence of Robo could is a robot, you know, so he could have existed as programming in the Prometheus circuit. Parts of him could have been the Prometheus circuit. But, yeah, in this scenario, Robo's essence and most of his parts were integrated into fate as the Promethean circuit. But he also existed in the form of his discarded shell, seen here. Robo's head at least, as we see here, is still around, and Luca has got some kind of function going from it. Okay, now on to the world at large. <laughs> Chrono Cross ends when Surge unifies the dimensions and saves Shala from the Time Devourer, but no reason is given to us to expect that there would be a universal whitewash with a generic happy ending that resulted from these actions. The socio-political state of the world would be largely the same following the game as the entire plot was the machinations of Balthazar to free Shala and stop the Time Devourer. That's great. We're all glad that Time Devourer will not destroy space-time continuum. However, there's some things that would not have just been fixed in both the home world and another world of Chrono Cross. Poor was still a dominant military force that was just basically pushing everyone around. We saw in Chrono Cross that Poor sort of pushed into El Nido a little bit. They took over Termina and Viper Manor, but General Viper often suspected Poor would one day launch a massive invasion of El Nido in search of the frozen flame. And so let's imagine after Chrono Cross, that's exactly what happened. I take you to the moments directly following Chrono Cross. Following Surge's battle with the Dragon God, the Dragoons are investigating Chronopolis where they find Luca alive. They release her and she flees with them to their home base in Viper Manor, bringing the crippled Robo with her. By this time, Poor has learned of the unique events occurring in El Nido and begun a full-scale invasion. Under General Viper's command, the Acacia Dragoons are resisting to save El Nido from being overrun, but in fact are being overwhelmed. The Porian forces are too vast. At the manor, they are making their final stand against the forces of Por, while at the same time, Por is claiming the frozen flame from its position atop Terra Tower. In Viper Manor, Luca finds Balthazar's lab, from which he departed for the future in the Neo Epoch. There, Luca meets Beach Bum, a new which imparts shocking news to her. How would he impart shocking news? Well, in the future with only Anu, Balthazar has managed to understand, finally, a rudimentary basis of their native language. Being able to communicate with Anu, he's confirmed that they do, in fact, see time as a singularity, and Balthazar calls them temporally entangled. Balthazar realizes that if you can get the, com the new to communicate to each other, they can actually communicate through time. So that's how he's talking to her from the future through the new beach bum. He says everything was for nothing. He played God out of necessity to save Shala and stop the time devourer, but the future refused to change. Catastrophe has still befallen them, and the future is worse than before. The earth has still been destroyed, presumably by Lavos, and humanity remains mostly extinct. Those who have survived are not the starving people in the domes we once knew, but a highly militarized coalition of despots, the remnants of the Porian Empire. Even more disturbing, his communications throughout time with the new are going dark. He suspects someone is eliminating them, and he's startled by their ability to do so in such a coordinated effort across time. 
Balthazar does not know how this happened and imparts his regret. He reports the Neo Epic has been damaged beyond repair, and although he's trapped in the future, he's instructed a beach bum to build a time egg there in the lab with materials at the manor. Balthazar says, Labos is an unknowable evil that must be stopped at its very origin on planet Earth. Although it's against his better judgment to continue to try and change the flow of time, he cannot sit idly by and watch the world become what he sees before him. Uh, meanwhile, in 1020 AD, Lucas' time is running out as well. Porian forces are breaking down the doors to the manor, and Beach Bum gives Luca the time egg, saying it will take her to the root of all the trouble. And Viper implores Luca to go. She cracks the time egg and disappears. Okay, I'll set the stage. In the sky, there was a red star about to fall. So this is shortly before Labos fell and hit the earth in the first place. The Ioka and Luruba tribes are engaged in a war with the Reptites. However, this time, both sides are employing futuristic weaponry. Luca seeks help from the humans, but the first thing she finds right away is that the humans are way different. Ayla and Kino are nowhere in sight, but the new leaders, Migo and Gigi, which are names that were originally going to be used in Chrono Trigger, but then thrown out. So, Migo and Gigi are like, who are you? When they find Luca, and she's kind of like, I'm a human. Uh, do you... I guess we're both humans, we should help each other, and they're like, no. Migo and Gigi are hostile to all humans not born of the dragon. They've sworn allegiance to the divine dragon, and if you're not with us, you're the enemy. So they attack. And so Luca runs, and, as she, and she's escaping the humans, and then she they get into a fight with the reptites, who then show up. And yeah, they've got the guns too. Luca's just like... What is going on? How can these cavemen and the reptites be using super lasers to fight each other? Laser guns. And then she gets captured by the reptites. They take her to the reptite lair. Azala comes down, being all creepy, and is like, you're, why, you're a strange-looking human. Luca knows her time is running out. The red star is going to fall. Lavos is going to hit the earth. Everyone's going to die. And she's got to tell Azala that. She's like, yo, your, your whole race of reptites is about to be eliminated unless we get out of here labos is gonna fall and we're all gonna die but azala is not buying it so luca has to convince her and she says okay look at this and shows her the fire magic which none of the other cave people can use magic so after a while she basically convinces azala that it can't hurt if the reptites just kind of move out of Tirano lair for a while while this weird thing falls out of the sky which it does. This time, the reptites avoid extinction when Labos falls. So Luca and Azala and everyone, all the reptites, just watch as Labos falls out of the sky and hits the Tyranno lair just like before and kicks up all this dust and it creates a huge calamity that Luca is just witnessing in abject horror. She then makes her move to save the future no matter what the cost. You gotta keep in mind, at this time, Luca has been a long troubled and tormented soul having seen her mother crippled, having fought to save the future only to wonder how many lives they sacrificed from other timelines. She then found happiness in the orphanage only to see poor kill Marl and Chrono, and for Lynx to burn the orphanage to the ground and enslave her in Chronopolis. And then Balthazar told her it was all for nothing. In this head state, Luca is ready to orchestrate a final plan to do as Balthazar said, and wipe out the source of all the trouble at its earliest time, no matter the cost. Luca puts on her hat. It's game face time. She's she's gonna do what she came here to do. After the dust settles from Labos colliding, she's like, yo, Azala, let's go kill that thing. So they go in there. All the reptites and Azala launch a massive attack on Labos at its basically earliest form. It just landed on Earth. It just hasn't burrowed down yet. Have all the, They have some futuristic weaponry, don't forget, too. They have some future guns. And they kill Labos. Imagine the big, familiar form of the Labos shell smoldering. 
In front of it, reptites carry away the still body of the Labos core, bloodied and obviously dead. Azala rallies the reptites to a cheer of victory while holding aloft one of the Labos bits. And then Luca is looking on. Luca's kind of aged now. She's kind of a little bit older. And she also looks, she's, she's looking on too, and she looks troubled. And she's holding one of the Labos bits too. Boom. So that starts this whole new timeline where Labos got defeated super early on. Um, you know, one of the themes for Chrono Trigger 2, as speculated by Masato Kato, was leaving the past behind. We're branching into totally new territory, of course, inspired by the old territory. But basically, Luca just reset the timeline from the original Chrono Trigger and the one that Chrono Cross happened on as well. 